So good afternoon. What a crowd. I am so impressed. And you know, this morning someone told me, well, the reason they're here is to see you. Then I started thinking about it, and I heard uh, Miss Mississippi entertain earlier today. You didn't come to see me. I think you came to hear her. She did an excellent job. Thank you. And then, of course, Coach Carter was here, and I got a chance to meet him. And, uh, and you know, they made a movie about him. They haven't quite made one about me yet. We'll see. But he said if they ever do, that he would like to star in it. So, <laughs> but uh, thank you, Coach Carter, for coming back and everything that you've reviewed today. Also, I'd like to recognize, of course, uh, Governor Bryant and uh, all the things that have been done to make Mississippi so much more business friendly. You only have to go back a few years ago, and that absolutely was not the case. Would also like to recognize Lieutenant Governor Reeves and Speaker Gunn. All of you have made a difference. But the real special people in this crowd today have to be the star students and the star teachers. Tell me who in the world makes a perfect score on their SAT, ACT, and also has higher than 100 average score in their grades for four years. So I tried to put together a list of what Nicholas and I have in common, and we both took the ACT test. <laughs> I better move on, that's about the end of that list. But that's just incredible, and I'm sure that uh, all of the star, uh, t uh, students are just gonna do an incredible job, uh, whatever they decide to do over the years. You know, I'm just absolutely thrilled to get back to Mississippi. I do get back as often as I can. But I can tell you there was one time in my life where my Mississippi heritage was questioned. And it was around the Liberty Bowl, and I stopped by the Rendezvous restaurant in Memphis. Everybody's familiar, some people familiar, right? The guy at the check-in counter asked me where I'm from. I said, Mississippi. And he argued with me that there was no way I was from Mississippi. And uh, then the person behind me, a customer in line, agreed with him. I think they thought I had just one more syllable too much in Mississippi than the way they said it, right? They were more talking Mississippi, but, uh, but uh, very, very glad to be back. And uh, I did start working for UPS when I was a freshman going to Delta State. I'd like to say I was recognized for my academic uh, accomplishments when I was there. But when I go back now, I'm more known for the person that would come in, work all that night at UPS, get a little bit of sleep, make an 8 o'clock class, and then at 10 o'clock would go to the second floor of the student union building, take off my shoes, and sleep for the next two hours. That same couch is still there, believe it or not. <laughs> I don't think I would uh, lay down on it now, though. And, uh, and I did get a chance over the last uh, 40 years of my career at UPS to move seven times all over the country. I thought that was pretty good until I heard David talk about moving 23 times, so that's a little bit different. And uh, my first, uh, I actually drove after I graduated in Pascagoula, Mississippi for a year. and. Uh, really learned the business, it was a great year. And then my first management job was in Natchez, Mississippi. And uh, then I was transferred to Jackson, got to run the Jackson Hub. There's some of the people that worked for me then that are here today, and we just had an incredible run together there. So I really think of the people that I worked with back then. We were all like brothers and sisters, it was a very close group. And I wouldn't be here today without many of them helping me along the way. And then we did our first move outside the state of Mississippi. We got moved to Nashville. My wife cried all the way there. We were leaving Mississippi. And uh, we were there for four years. Then we got transferred to New Jersey. I cried all the way there. <laughs> I, 
I tell people it was my first international experience. <laughs> and when people in New Jersey met me, they thought they were meeting someone from another country too, right? And but really, it was an incredible experience for me. It's an example of how UPS will take people out of their comfort zone and then see how they can handle that situation. So I spent uh, 40, I mean four of the best years of my career there. <laughs> And, uh, and it was a great experience. But I do appreciate getting to come back. And I tell you that I almost got good goosebumps today. I could feel them starting to happen when the governor started talking about all the accomplishments. Because the people that benefit from that are the citizens of this state, right? The good jobs that are here today that were not here a few years ago. And it's just, I'm so impressed with that. I will tell you that when I was named uh, the CEO, one of the first phone calls that I got on my cell phone congratulating me was from the governor. You know, I still don't know how he got my cell phone number, but sometimes you just don't ask questions, right? And uh, so really, I'd like to just talk a little bit about some of those accomplishments. And I know the governor talked about a few of these, but Mississippi is now a world leader in oil and gas development. And, uh, and a national leader in supporting entrepreneurs. And the governor and I were talking about this at lunch, but it's these entrepreneurs, these people that run small and mid-sized businesses, we've got to, as a country, we've got to make it easier for them to, to do business. And I believe that the state of Mississippi has done so. And then when the governor talked about being number one in women-owned uh, businesses, uh, that is just so important to our country and to this state. Really proud of that. And then look at all the international companies that have moved in to Mississippi in the last few years. So a lot of people deserve credit for that. Obviously, it starts with the, with the governor, but it's the Mississippi Economic Council and the Mississippi Development Authority should all be proud of their accomplishments. But you know, competition is out there. Whether it's a company like UPS, that people are always trying to, to figure out a way to do something we can't do, or whether it's other states that are going to try to catch up, we can never let our guards down. So it's with uh, great pride, but a little bit of caution, that I urge everyone in the room, you know, we haven't made the finish line yet. We certainly have a good start on it. But we need to push for additional educational capabilities. Let's continue to find opportunities to improve education for our young people. Let's continue to encourage more and more investment in this state. And we're doing a great job with that, but let's keep that up. The diversification among business, among businesses and types of businesses. When I was growing up in the Mississippi Delta, it was almost all farm related. Look at how diversified Mississippi's become. And more jobs that lead to promising careers. We don't want our young people to believe that they have to leave the state of Mississippi to be successful. Obviously, some will, and that's good. They may come back. But we want to create these opportunities here, and that's what's happening. So I really believe that Mississippi is positioned for success and the initiatives like the Economic Council's, Council's Blueprint for Success is a good example of that. So Mississippi's position to be a leader to come. I'd also like to talk just a little bit about UPS's presence here in Mississippi. We came to Mississippi in 1968, so six years before I joined. Today we have 46 facilities taking care of small package, freight forwarding, and supply chain solution customers. We have 25 UPS stores that do, for the large part, take care of these small and mid-sized companies that I talked about. And we have nearly 3,000 employees in the state of Mississippi, and about 6% of those are veterans, and we're really proud of our veterans' initiatives. And, uh, here in Jackson, we've chose Jackson as one of the locations where we put our liquefied natural gas tractors 
Anybody notice the UPS natural gas tractor that was outside? Even if you didn't, just work with me here. Tell me you did, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and we're real proud of that, and that just represents the 5,000 alternative fuel vehicles that we have across our network. But you know, now, as Blake covered, we do have almost 100,000 trucks. We have 500 planes. We're in 220 countries and territories. When I first started, I had to memorize places in the U.S. that we didn't even go to. Now we're in every country and territory that the U.S. government allows us to be in. And uh, we have 435,000 employees and almost 300,000 here in the United States. And of that 300,000, there's about 25,000 veterans that are our employees. So that's something we're proud of. You may have noticed a new ad campaign, and it's United Problem Solvers. I'm not going to ask you how many have seen that, because I may not be happy if I didn't get a lot of response. But, and we're not changing our names, obviously, but United Problem Solvers is telling our customers, telling businesses that we can solve your logistics problems no matter how big they are, no matter where they are, in any part of the world. And so you'll probably hear a lot more about that. So we think it's unique capabilities that, uh, that we can provide uh, our customers around the world. You know, I want to talk about a huge opportunity for the state of Mississippi and for our nation and obviously for, for my company at the same time, and that's global trade. Global trade already supports here more than 50,000 Mississippi jobs, and that can be just the beginning. Mississippi exported, exported more than $12 billion in goods and services in 2013, and you know that number is higher today. But you know, what is so important is 95% of the world's uh, population lives outside the United States. 80% of the world's purchasing power is outside the United States. It is extremely important that U.S. businesses, Mississippi businesses, learn how to cater and how to serve that growing market. Only 1% of the nation's small and mid-sized businesses export currently in the United States. Look at the opportunity that's missed. And of that 1%, only about 60% of that 1% goes to more than one country. So it's usually Canada or it's Mexico. And that's just a lost opportunity that we would like to see change. The Small Business Administration says that companies that do export have 20% more success than, than companies that don't. They're 20% more, percent more productive, 20% more uh, profitable. But there are some barriers to trade, and that's what I want to spend a few minutes to talk about. And trade's not always easy, especially for these small and mid-sized businesses that don't have export departments and people that they can just devote to learning the rules and regulations. It's these kinds of barriers, such as the high tariffs, the red tape, the customs inconsistencies, that keep a lot of companies from exporting. And uh, these are exactly the barriers that we're trying to overcome with some free trade agreements that I'll talk about. First, I'd like to talk about uh, TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and, and Investment uh, Partnership. And that, of course, is connecting the two largest markets in the world, the United States and Europe. And uh, we still got a lot of work to do on this agreement. Could be uh, in the next year or two, could take a little longer, but it's extremely important to us. TTIP would bring 100 and 19 billion euros to the European economy and about $100 billion to the U.S. economy. One that's a little bit closer now, and you may have seen that yesterday the Japan Prime Minister spoke to Congress, but that is TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And uh, I believe, 
as the CEO of UPS, but also as a member of the President's Export Council, the Council believes that we are very close to getting an agreement across the Pacific. In order to do that, though, the President does need trade promotion authority, and you know Congress is considering that today. Without trade promotion authority, a country could negotiate or a group of countries can negotiate with the United States, with the administration, and then Congress could renegotiate after that. So you would, in fact, be dealing with two different negotiations. With trade promotion authority, Congress gets to set some of the guidelines before the negotiations begin. Then the administration negotiates and then Congress gets to vote yes or gets to vote no. And we believe that is very, very important to the success of these free trade agreements. And uh, in Mississippi, just to show you how important these free trade agreements are, in Mississippi, in the last 10 years, we've seen a 380% increase in export growth to countries where the U.S. has trade agreements. In our business, we see a 20% increase in exports from the United States immediately to another country if we uh, institute a, a, a free trade agreement. So we're certainly very hopeful that this will happen. When it does, these barriers get removed. It could be as easy to ship to Macau as it is to Meridian, and that would be a pretty good thing. At the same time, we'd like to talk about a, another opportunity that ties into trade, and that's online commerce. And uh, domestic online retail is expected to grow four times the GDP. If you look at that slide, you can see what I'm talking about. So what business would not be looking for an opportunity that's growing four times GDP? Cross-border e-commerce is growing at seven times GDP. So if you're looking for opportunities for your business, this is certainly a way to look. And a lot of companies are getting in on that trend. One is a local company here that many of you would be familiar with, Forestry Suppliers. They're located here in Jackson, in fact, not far at all from this building. They provide tools and equipment for forestry, environmental science, engineering, horticulture, and, uh, and other related industries. Jim Craig started this company in his garage 66 years ago. Orders came to their mailbox, and he and his wife and his daughter would fill their orders. Then they would use that red wagon that you see to carry those packages to the post office. You gotta remember, 66 years ago, now they utilize UPS a lot. We're very thankful for that. If they didn't, I probably wouldn't tell this story, right? And uh, so they have a staff of about 100 people, and they operate in of about 100,000 square feet. And I recently visited with Jeff Holland's head, and he was talking about how they've saturated pretty much the U.S. market and that the international markets is where their growth potential was. He says, that's our future. But then he also talked about the financial difficulty of tariffs and value-added taxes that can add 50 to 100 percent to his cost. That's where these trade agreements could make a difference, could make a difference to companies right here in the state, which would also lead to creating jobs. So when you're talking about investments in these free trade agreements, I'd like to spend just a minute to talk about the investments we're making in these two areas, particularly around uh, e-commerce and around emerging markets. But uh, we're in our 108th year as a company, and, uh, and last year we invested a little bit over $2.3 billion to increase capacity and uh, and to enhance and enlarge our network. And we are having a lot of focus on these emerging markets, places that maybe you wouldn't be nearly as familiar with. China, everybody understands, and China's got a huge potential, and we've been there for quite a while. But take a country like Indonesia. 
A lot of people here may not know a lot about Indonesia, how many thousands of islands that it is. It's soon going to be a top 10 economy, and if you're going to ship to these emerging middle classes and serve that market, you need to get familiar with, with Indonesia. Not too many people could even find it right now on a map, unless you have the 36 ACT score and then the 100% average, and then you probably could talk about every province that is in the country, right? But, uh, but these emerging markets are going to continue to have a, a big effect on the next 10 to 20 years. We want to be a part of that. We're also, as a company, focused on uh, industry-specific solutions, such as healthcare, high-tech, and retail. And you know, as I told you, we were 108 years old. We started as a messenger company. We went into the package business, and now we are a supply chain solutions provider throughout the world. And we've seen a lot of change, but we've never seen the pace of business change as much as it is today. I'd like to take the last few minutes to talk, about, uh, talk to some of the students and uh, the star students that are here today. And, uh, and they are the celebrities, they are the people that, uh, that this state's future and our country's future relies on. And, uh, and before long, it's going to be in their hands. And, uh, and they're going to get a lot of opportunity. They're going to hear that they've got a lot of potential. The question is, are they going to be able to live up to that potential? And I believe that they will. I believe that they will be part of this power play that you guys are talking about here. And I think they will continue to, to add esteem and continue to help this great state to progress through the years. I hope there's something today that they have heard, whether it's from me or from others, that has helped change their perspective just a little bit. Have them to look at life just a little different. Have them to believe that maybe there's more opportunity than they thought before. But just because we talk to people about changing their perspective doesn't mean they always do, right? And I'll just give you a quick example as I'm closing up. I'm in the park this past weekend with my four-year-old grandson, and he climbs up this big ramp, he slides down this big slide. At the end, this six-year-old had stacked a whole lot of tree mulch at the bottom of the slide so that whoever comes down is gonna hit it, and this stuff is gonna splatter everywhere, including all over Sam's face, inside his shorts, everywhere. Sam was not happy. He expressed that unhappiness to this six-year-old by saying, don't ever do that again, stinky face. <laughs> now, I didn't really get the stinky face part. You know, I've heard stinky pants, but not stinky face. I go, Sam, I understand you're upset, but you know we don't call people names. I want you to tell him that you're sorry. He looks at me, then he looks at the six-year-old, and he goes, Sorry, stinky face. <laughs> so I tried to change his perspective. I wasn't quite successful, right? And I wish I could tell you as a good, responsible grandparent that I put him in time out and I taught him this valuable lesson. I was so busy biting my lip, trying to keep from laughing, that I didn't quite do that. But I tell you, this state is changing the nation's perspective about Mississippi. You have an absolute lot to be proud of. I have a lot to be proud of. And uh, I am sure that with the leadership and the efforts of all the people in this room, that this day is going to continue until it's number one in most all areas. And I'm very proud of that. So thank you very much.